Uh, Tyson, let's start. Very good. Okay. Thank you all for coming out, or uh, should I say online, this afternoon for our annual Ada Louise Huxtable Lecture in honor of the longtime New York Times architecture critic. My name is Tyson Gaskill, and I am the current president of the Ruskin Art Club. Now, you might wonder why an organization named the Ruskin Art Club, which has been in existence since 1888, would host an event about architecture. Well, Ruskin was a great polymath and contains multitudes. Besides his interest in art, ecology, and labor, he wrote extensively about architecture. Uh, to wit, his uh, famous work, The Seven Lamps of Architecture, which was first published in 1849, which argued for a, uh, a kind of spiritual reconnection in the field of architecture, which um, I think Ruskin had seen as getting away from architects and builders during the Industrial Revolution. He thought that architecture should be reflective of the glory of mankind and the divine and not simply a test of how far engineering could be pushed. For this year's Ada Louise Huxtable Lecture, we are absolutely delighted to have Huggy Bellsberg. He is the founding partner of BA Collective, an architecture and interior design firm based here in Santa Monica. He received his uh, Master of Architecture with distinction from Harvard University and held teaching, uh, has held teaching positions at UCLA, USC, and SciArc. Uh, since 1997, he has built and has quite a diverse portfolio of award-winning work. Uh, often using digital fabrication and non-traditional construction methods. So we'll, we'll find out more about that, what that means. Um, and I, some of you may have already seen this, but uh, he's been honored quite a bit already. He's uh, honored by the AIA, that's the American Institute of Architects, California Council as an emerging talent. Um, he was recognized as an emerging voice by the Architectural League of New York. Um, he's also been confirmed into the College of Fellows of AIA for his notable contributions to the advancement of the profession of architecture. Um, he's he's won over 100 awards. That's uh, probably more than all of us put together here. So um, we're, we are indeed happy to have him. Um, he's also been included in exhibitions uh, all over the world, USA, Spain, Greece, Canada. Um, he's published extensively. Um, so we are here to hear more about how he has used, um, as I mentioned, digital fabrication and non-traditional construction methods um, in his work. So um, he is going to, Huggy is gonna entrance us for the next 45 minutes, and then uh, we'll have plenty of time for questions uh, with him following his talk. So without further ado, please welcome uh, virtually Huggy Belsberg. Thank you so much, Tyson. I'm very, very honored to be here. And first, I'd like to thank Student Denenberg for reaching out to us. We had the pleasure of meeting him at our Holocaust Museum event last year. And I'd also like to thank the Ruskin Art Club for inviting me to speak at this annual event to honor Ada Louise Huxtable. Um, she had a wonderful, prolific career and was a true pioneer in the world of architecture. And this is an extraordinary event and I'm so grateful and honored. Um, today, I am going to be speaking about um, one project in specific. It's the Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. And we are also not only gonna see the existing museum, but we're also going to look at what we are under construction with right now uh, moving forward. I titled this uh, talk called The Architecture of Tragedy um, because it's a very, very, um, poignant subject right now, very difficult subject to build architecture for. And um, I thought it'd be a real good uh, deep dive uh, uh, discussion we could have um, because, you know, in honor of a, of a, of a prolific critic, I think this is a, a, a very apropos project to um, discuss. So the architecture of tragedy, let's go to the first slide. Um, let's talk about the where, how, and all this began. First of all, this is many of you know Pan Pacific Park. It's in the it's in the Fairfax district of Los Angeles. It's a quite a large park. And in 1972, next slide, there was a um, a monument to the Holocaust survivors that have come to Los Angeles. And as you can see, 
um, this this type of uh, uh, monument had some iconographic features that are very much meant to evoke uh, emotions. Uh, you can see the barbed wire fencing, some anti-tank uh, um, concrete elements, and uh, six black columns representing um, six million um, who perished, six million Jews who perished in the Holocaust. Now, what we were trying to do is really uh, uh, come up with an idea, an architecture that would both invite those into, into a dialogue and as well as mourn and describe the events in a in a um, in a case study as how to prevent uh, tragedies, uh, human tragedies uh, in the future. But we would want to start with identifying what are these kind of iconographic features. Next slide. So looking back at maybe um, some previous derivatives and and um, listening to uh, some looking at, at, at very successful monuments and architecture and, and Holocaust uh, uh, architecture. We looked at Theodore Adorno in 1949. He wrote, you know, building after our, in building after architecture, um, Rosenfeld quoted him as saying, the Holocaust could be easily exploited, especially in realistic and mimic modes of representation. And we wanted to really try to stay away from that. Uh, next slide. Um, and next slide. And that's where we we looked at other architecture of of tragedy buildings that focused on Holocaust. And we look at one outside of Detroit, where you can see the use of barbed wire again. And next slide. And the use of uh, pajama um, uh, clothing on um, on the building, which was really uh, a, a quandary to us. Why would how would this evoke uh, the teachings of what happened or how to prevent? Uh, next slide. And then we would look at Stanley Tigerman's Holocaust Museum. And again, look at the rep representation that he was evoking, uh, incorporating light and darkness uh, in materials. And what he also established as these two columns to uh, represent hierarchical uh, elements and, and the architecture itself had a very suspicious uh, tonality to it. We don't really understand what connection it does have historically to a specific um, uh, genre of architecture. Next. And then finally, one of the most famous architecture Holocaust museums is, um, is uh, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC where here you have almost a Speer approach to neoclassical architecture, actually the opposite of what you want to try to evoke. Next. And the interior where there was a representation of a, of a train station and even a, a staircase that was supposed to signify the, the um, over ramp in, um, in the Warsaw ghetto. So these ideas of kind of icon iconic elements really were meant to say to somebody, this is what it might have felt like, and this is what we want you to feel in as experiencing the museum. And that is actually the exact opposite of what we were interested in. We know people come from many, many backgrounds and, and age ages and, and cultures. And with, with their experiences, you can't really tell people how to how to feel, and definitely not with iconic elements. Next. So we looked at some projects that actually started immersing one's um, experience and with emotion. This is Eisen, Eisenman's um, memorial in Berlin. And we found it to be really exceptional, not only in its in its brutalistic and and and, and impassioned kind of uh, nature where it forces you to, to to question what is underfoot next, but how it really starts to um, engage with the urban uh, environment around next. Specifically, how it edges and borders the city. Now, it's a nuanced scenario, but what you see when you go there is not only a monument to those killed, but you also see the normality of it all. 
kids playing with their kids playing with their toys and their parents, uh, people doing Instagram shoots, not really identifying with what's happening uh, and why it was initially erected. Next. And um, actually, if you can go back one, I'm sorry. And, and in there lies what I believe to be a, a real special opportunity. Um, maybe many of you have seen um, uh, the zone of interest that just uh, that uh, would be uh, compelling to understand that when you have a, a, you have these dualities that occur in in our society, where on one hand, people can be enjoying a picnic in the park, uh, going with a lover to um, handing, uh, walking hand in hand, but you know, yards away, feet away, murderous, horrible things can happen. This not only happened in the past, but happens continually today and will unfortunately continue in our future. It is that kind of dialogue that we wanted to evoke conversation. Next. Slide. So we were able, we were given a, a very small piece of land to the northeast, sorry, to the northwest of the of the park, where we able to wrap around the monument, as you can see in the center. And the idea here is to cohabitate with the park and not have any iconic emblems, any kind of iconic architectural features that would relate to perhaps a World War II um, um, architecture or, or anything that relates to religion or culture, but really taking the architecture of the landscape and making that its major feature, wrapping it up so that that is the first thing that one sees. Next slide. And the idea is um, that the, there's a seamlessness between a public park and a museum that is here to uncover and unearth and discuss through archival information, the horrors of the Holocaust. Now, what? how do you teach the Holocaust in Los Angeles when it's something that happened a long time ago in a, in a different continent, and you're trying now to um, teach what, um, what are hopefully um, you know, thousands of kids a year? The museum was actually not only built for just the general public, but it has a very strong mission that is dedicated to teaching um, high school kids. And we have a there is a program where we um, uh, pay for and bring in students from US um, LAUSD schools. And um, sometimes these schools, this is the only vacation, uh, sorry, the only um, uh, 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 the only um, uh, field trip they'll have all year. And what we tried to do is design this around their experience. And what you can see in the bottom right is the drop off where the school buses um, um, park. And what the students see is at first sight is the park itself and the museum at the same time with no discerning um, uh, 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 feature that blocks uh, off either of them. They just see the park and a green roof. Next slide. And as they come off the bus, what they see are people enjoying, you know, picnics and walking hand in hand, much like the parks and the forests during 1934 to, through 42 in Europe. And then as they go through the they're cut through the green roof and they are slowly led down a ramp. Next slide. The sights and sounds of the museum start to be removed and it literally becomes an acoustical um, isolation as they walk down. Next slide. And then as they enter the lobby, which is right in the middle um, and they are going through each exhibit, the museum plan, the floor of the museum at every exhibit stall lowers itself about a foot and the light of the museum, um, the natural light, it begins to be removed. The first exhibit room, next slide, the first exhibit room you can see um, in, the, in the top middle with all the round circles are, is the uh, Europe, is an exhibit we call Europe before the Holocaust. And everybody is around one table, a community, if you will. And then slowly the exhibit starts to separate 
the participants until they become individuals. But not only does the exhibits separate the individuals, but the light in the space becomes darker. The two story height starts to compress and it becomes more of a, an uncomfortable feeling until you get to the middle of the exhibit where we speak about the, the Holocaust and in the concentration camps. And then you are experiencing them individually. And then as you go around the proverbial um, uh, turn of events, the light, natural light co starts coming back into the into the exhibits and slowly um, you enter into the uh, uh, where you ended up, where you started and um, you are a community again. Next slide. And we tested these with different mock-ups mock and lighting techniques and natural lighting techniques. Next slide. And then finally, the, um, the actual museum. So as you can see, this is the, I'm gonna take you through as the immersive experience. Um, this is the first um, experience you have seeing the park um, lap itself over as a green roof over the museum, slowly going down the ramp. Next slide. The sights and the sounds of the, muse of the park slowly go away. So um, you are left with more of an experience of um, the museum itself. Next slide. And entering, you can see you are faced with um, um, seeing where you had come from. Next slide. And the natural light permeates in the lobby with a two-story high space. The first exhibit that you see, you can see there's a there's a black and white screen, is a is a video by a man named Jack Taylor who went to Hollywood High, and he says. Hi, I'm Jack Taylor. I went to Hollywood High, but he's actually a liberated POW. He is speaking in a very California accent. And very quickly, you realize that this is not something that happened to another group of people over there. It actually affected locally uh, residents here in Los Angeles. And that kind of um, mix of of eventual of, of events was really how we were trying to immerse um, history, both in Los Angeles and what happened in, in Europe. Next slide. Um, there was also, there's also this translucency that we opened through the museum itself. So you can see here, um, we use, we use concrete, but we were able to digitally fabricate large stencils and shoot concrete like you do a swimming pool. So you get a very fluid kind of motif. The idea here is to upend the idea of what is concrete. So it becomes more of a malleable um, um, element or it appears to be malleable, but it is not. And you are constantly given this um, perception of seeing through. And the idea here, next slide, is that time is never, um, a, a, a time and how we teach any event, specifically the Holocaust, is not stagnant, but it was actually constant. So the the as you can see here, the the exhibits don't go to the ceiling; they stay uh, at twice as high, almost twice as high as a person. But you are able to see that the building is a container for the exhibit, not actually trying to teach, but allowing the uh, the artifacts to teach. Next, as you can he see here from this image. So the building is basically the, the ideal of time and the passage of time, and you are going through the exhibits, but time would be the constant. And you can see here, we reverse, um, uh, um, the, we reverse uh, ignite the light from, from our ramp, where because of the ramp, we are allowed to have as much natural light come in at, the, at its base where you start the uh, tour. But as you go through towards the back, the natural light, which is your basically the signifier of hope, slowly removes itself. Next. The first exhibit where we sit around a table or we look at an interactive um, uh, digital uh, experience where everybody is connected together like a, a pre-Holocaust Europe. Next. And then slowly, um, as it as you lower yourself into the museum and it gets darker, everybody is slowly separated. Next. Until you get to the final uh, room, or should I say the middle room, before you turn the corner in history, uh, there is no light and you are only faced with a lowering ceiling of about eight and a half feet. Next. 
and you make the proverbial turn, light starts to come through and we go through the, um, the information that leads us to liberation and such. But you can see here that when the way we opened up the museum and the exhibits, that even though maybe some cities were being liberated, other cities were just starting to uh, have deportation. So that idea that time, it's not a snapshot, but it was a constant, you're able to see through the buildings, uh, the exhibit at all time to understand that things weren't happening in parallel. Next. And finally, when you come out of the museum, you are then um, introduced back into the park where you see people engaging in their in their normal activities once again. And it's these two that live together that we were trying to exploit. We were trying to uh, use these as the dialogue where teachers and docents can really start to uh, answer questions. Why do these still why do these events still happen? Next. But in the final space is the children's memorial. And this was a very difficult um, room to design. Um, how do you design a, a children's memorial? Really, really trying to speak to the students that are there, that, you know, trying to explain to them, trying to describe to them without numbers. Um, 1.6 million kids were murdered that were 16 and under. And how do you really describe that number, 1.6? Next slide. So the way we try to do it is we digitally fabricated these GFRC panels, and they're they're each one has a unique pattern to it um, in their sixes. But if you turn them around, you get a unique pattern all the way to 1.2 million. We couldn't even reach 1.6 million. But what they have here is um, voids. Now the voids are of different size, different shapes, different depths, and each void is representing one soul, one child's soul. Next. And what had happened from this uh, undesigned, and this was not prescribed, was students started to place notes inside. And to the point where the museum was collecting them and archiving them, so that they started pro providing these more systematic type of pads where people can write a note and place them. But this happened organically and had nothing to do with our um, ideal. We wanted to really represent the enormity of scale in terms of what a 1.6 million is, and um, but an interactive quality grew from there with the students, which was really quite extraordinary. Next. But it's where we place the architecture and the space that was really important. In this image, you see um, the, the, the voids in the panels, and it's open to the sky. But we were very careful where we placed this. We didn't have um, any interest and ambition for um, exhibit notes and and uh, things that would describe um, what you're seeing. It was it was meant to be very intuitive. And what we had done was try to use the ambient uh, ambient condition to support our idea. We had placed this room. Um, adjacent to the playground uh, that exists right now at Pan Pacific Park, the basketball and uh, courts and playgrounds. So when you're in this room, you hear kids playing. You hear teenagers trying to um, play basketball. And that laughter is void of any imagery. You don't see the kids, but you see the voids in the wall. So we're really trying to play off of a, a sensory um, uh, immersion and 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 really try to have students experience that so that it is um, something that that captures the essence of loss, but it but it doesn't have to be something that really is is told, but it's something is felt. Next, and you don't have to be from any specific background, culture, age to experience it. Um, next slide. So what's happening next and how do we design for the future? On the right, number seven, you can see this is where our existing museum is. And number one is where we're, we're now planning to build a new pavilion. The pavilion is called a learning pavilion. It's increasing the building um, over twice as, as twice as large. And what's important here is we have um, an artifact um, museum 
that teaches the past and it teaches um uh, it it tries to evoke as as described uh, students you know not only the this this dialogue that we play between the public realm and um and the horrors of 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 not saying no go unchecked but um but also this idea of how it connects back to los angeles in various ways but what is it about the future that we can we can now try to evoke so the learning pavilion number 1 is a is a is a large exhibit hall that really tries to capture and invite traveling exhibits from all over the world um here we'll be able to also include different exhibits from um you know other other uh, uh you know, maybe it's an exhibit on Pol Pot or Rwanda, Bosnia Herzegovina. The idea is to really capitalize on 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 humanity when it's left unchecked, and how it is, um, and how we're able to uh, prevent it in the future. This building really does not live or exist in the ground, but it exists above ground. It exists actually as a bridge. It exists over uh, a water uh, a water uh, gateway. This is the nine is uh, is an area where it channels water from um, most of this area as a as a uh, as a water retention air, uh, site, and our building really does bridge over that. Next, and here you can see with the top elevation we're bridging over the gate. And it truly is a, a trust building that bridges. And it's um, it will have other features in it as well, including um, classrooms and we're and working with the Shoa USC Shoa Foundation to have a, 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 a um, uh, how do you call it a um, interactive uh, screening room and a 200 person fixed seating screening room as well. Next. Um, not only that, but we are also able to uh, now receive for the first time a um, an artifact box car where we'll be displaying that as well on the roof of the existing museum where you can see number 12. So the building now is, expands as a past, present, and future type, type of um, architecture where the center between the two museums is an open courtyard where one is able to pause between the exhibits and really try to create these different um, experiences outside of the exhibits where you can basically reflect. Next. Um, again, sustainability, like in our first museum, is going to be a primary feature. And sustainability here is on, on display and not hidden, where we promote photovoltaic, um, expression on our roof where you can see it as a pedestrian, where we're capturing water and using it to um, irrigate the, the green roof as well. So um, sustainability, it goes hand in hand with, um, with the ability to teach um, about the Holocaust. Next. And here we see some of our renderings from Grove Avenue. Um, what you'll see, go to the next one, please. And first and foremost is where our first building was below grade. Our next building and its entry over the courtyard is definitely more celebrated um, in a hierarchical entrance. Now, um, the idea is using a, 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 it's a Teflon type of fabric where we really try to create a the ceremonial entry. And here we do use some very um, ubiquitous symbolism, a canopy, somewhere where people congregate, um, 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 a, a tent with open with open um, sides, so all are welcome is really the idea. Um, really trying to create a more of an inviting element than just um, than just uh, walls. Walls, unfortunately, are now um, necessary. Where we designed our first building, we had no barriers and people could just walk in. Today's environment unfortunately requests that we are a little bit more, a lot more secure and that's what we have done. So we have added um, security around, but it's still, we still try to evoke the sense of lightness, the sense of transparency, the sense of um, openness and invitation. Next. A view from the park showing the bridge building 
and open amphitheater that we are incorporating um, into the design, really uh, 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 the stewards of Pan Pacific Park and the Holocaust Museum working together to program it for um, public use. Next. Um, and an image of the courtyard between the two buildings and peering into the uh, glass enclosed pavilion where the boxcar will be next. Um, and next. Uh, here is an image of um, the boxcar. We were able to have um, an original artifact donated to us. There are very, very few boxcars left in the world. And the ones that are left um, are, are in very, very poor condition. We are um, fortunate enough to be able to um, rebuild this one and um, have it stand in perpetuity in a, in a hermetically sealed environment to protect it. But it's how we approach it and circulate around it that was important to us. Um, many of us have seen these images of these boxcars, these horrendous uh, images of families being torn apart and people lifted up in. And that's what we wanted to do. So you do start from um, grade level, uh, not from the level of the boxcar, but you do start from below, from the wheels. And you walk, you are able to walk around to see the enormity and the horrors of the boxcar. And finally, being able to peer through it as you um, enter and then exit out. Next. The temporary exhibit hall, which is actually a bridge um, with temper with with movable panels that will allow um, exhibits to be introduced from all over the world. Um, you can see uh, probably those of you who have worked with exhibits are um, shaking your head at the natural light, but we do have covers for them. And what we wanted to do is not take away from that dialogue that we initially started with the original museum, where you are always looking at the public park while still looking at maybe something that is a little, a lot more difficult to engage with. But those exhibits that come to us that require um, UV uh, control or UV um, filtration or even no UV, we have panels to remove the light. But it was the idea that we can have that dialogue be a constant, whether you're outside or inside the building. Next. And finally, we have a 200 person fixed theater that we are able to now have um, lecture halls in a state of the art um, uh, 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 setting. Next. And then finally, at the very end, um, we will try to illuminate the, the um, canopy over the courtyard as a signifier that um, the Holocaust Museum and its learning pavilion is truly here as, as, a, as a necessary element to teach and to invite. And um, really, it was, it was important to us to really celebrate and not to hide. And... Um, with that, I am happy to take any questions. Um, I'll go ahead and and start, Hagi. Um, wow, I thank you so much for that. I, I, you know, I've worked in some amazing buildings, both at USC and at the Getty Museum. But I have to say, I'm I'm jealous of the future employees here at at this museum because your plans look absolutely amazing, and and I say that realizing. The content is incredibly difficult. Um, let, let's be right upfront about that. Um, speaking of difficult content, I, I'm I'm somewhat struck by the difference between your work here and the Museum of Tolerance. That's not your work, I know. Um, down down the street a little ways, which feels um, I don't know. Dare I say a bit more like a traditional monolithic museum structure. Um, so I, I I think obviously you 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 guys went in a different direction, which I I think is great. And even though they're obviously different in style and content, I feel like your work has a bit more spiritual kinship with uh, Daniel Liebeskin's Adventurous Jewish Museum in Berlin, which opened in mm. two thousand and one. Did you have that in mind at all? And I you know again they they are different structures, but um, obviously both of them are. Um, expanding the concept of what a museum of, of this type of content could look like. Um, 
And lastly, as a very much a side note, as a USC library employee, I'm just thrilled to find out about the Shoah Foundation Theater there. I had not heard about that. So that's that was great news. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. It's so as you guys can all imagine, these are um, possibly the most difficult times of museums to to design. I mean, what what um, element, what material do you begin with? What um, what story do you tell? What story um, can you even be? How do you even begin to try to teach to um, students in a in a unified school district where they are? Uh, many are also um, escaping their own traumas and their own and and their own societal um, ills. And how do you suggest to them that this is somewhat more important than what they've experienced? But how do you connect it in architecture? And that idea is that we start with landscape. We start with more of a an evote. A, 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 you try to be emotive by by material and space alone, something that crosses cultural lines. I think Liebeskin um, removes this kind of iconic element as well. We were trying to do it, definitely Eisenman was doing it. And you allow people to experience the way they experience, the way they their past actually um, evokes their um, uh, interests. And not try to say this is the way an arc, you know, uh, uh, somebody tells you you need to understand uh, something of such difficult teachings. So the idea to be reductive, but more in keeping with, um, uh, the, in our case, with the original museum, the landscape, and um, trying to constantly reduce, reduce. So the artifact is the one telling the story. But the space itself, as I was describing, is also making you feel a certain way, a certain a certain um, uh, compression, uncomfortableness, darkness, but then a sense of light and a sense of of um, of, of uh, experiencing that you've gone through something. You know, we all as humans have a sense of those experiences, and that's what really I was trying to connect. And even at a almost like at a child level. And allow the and allow the content, allow the information to speak to itself. It is it is powerful enough, so you don't have to, for example, put the barbed wire on the on the walls. Yeah. It's it's powerful enough. The imagery is is difficult enough. Yeah. Speaking of the barbed wires, well, sorry, one last thing. I really wish that those power lines in front of that Detroit <laughs> museum had been buried. I just ruined that photo, <laughs> but it's still a uh, it's still a, a you know a nice structure. But uh, yes. yeah, anyway, um, does anybody uh, who would like to go next? I'm sure somebody's got something. Uh, Gabriel, yes. Yeah, I just you know that Keats has that famous line that we resist poems that have designs on us, um, and it's all you know it's always struck me in that enormously difficult set of choices that go with specifically uh, Holocaust museums. You know, I, I spent some time in DC with the with the US uh, Holocaust Memorial Museum there, of course, Yad Vashem in, in Jerusalem and so forth. And always those choices about how much and how literally do you try to reproduce an experience for people. And I think uh, what what inspires me about what you've done is both uh, the integration with the landscape, which which, which is so Ruskinian uh, that you know that that the building doesn't stand against the land, but works with it. And then this other this very clearly very deep attempt to to think through architecturally how you create a memorial space with this kind of simplicity and with a certain kind of freedom and a certain lack of literalness in it where where we're sensing that the uh, the, the architects you know want us to feel a certain way or or the architects are 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 leading us to certain associations uh, so i i really um i i really appreciate the um the discernment uh, that I see, you know, at work in these designs. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, yes, <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Lauren. Did, do you want to 
go ahead. And, uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Hagi. It's a really beautiful um, continuation of a story. I was actually the public relations director of the LA Museum of the Holocaust when it was 6505 Wilshire Boulevard on the top floor. And just as a background, that this, this museum, not that, well, that museum, but this museum too, which is quite quite different, was founded by Holocaust survivors, That's which right. makes it quite different from the Wiesenthal Center, which That's became right. Beit HaShoah, the museum of the, the, the House of Holocaust, of the Shoah, and that was basically a Shiva University building fund project. That's right. And, and it's really important to understand the distinctions between the institutional decisions about what can and should be made versus the communal process. And, mm, that's right. And I, and I think it's very important for people to understand what what goes on. When it was the original uh, Museum of the Holocaust uh, on top of the 65 and 5 Jewish Federation building, it was really a, a place where you could go and see what survivors were bringing in uh, from their own personal lives. And that's the basis of this collection. It that was, that, that was, is a that is awesome. like Tom Blatt's uh, uh, Sobibor uh, monument. I was there when he brought that in. So the I, the objects that are on display at the LA Moss, uh, which has a new name too, and I don't remember what it is, but it'll change again, I'm sure. Um, it's really very intimate. It, it's it's very understandable from a human perspective. It's not it's not monumental. Um, so that's that's part one. Part two is uh, I've been through the exhibit. Uh, several times with docents, without docents. Um, and I recommend it to people because there's so much to learn about life and not just about death and 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 the the, the crazy times that uh, that happened then and who knows when it can happen again. Uh, doesn't take much imagination to understand it. But the emphasis on a place for children is really critical because when they were deciding, what to do about the children's memorial originally at the 6505 building, they built this small room, which was basically the interior of a box car. And, and it, was, it was very somber and there was, a, there was an eternal light at the end of it, um, which many Holocaust uh, memorials have. And to remember, this is not just a memorial, this is a museum, a place of learning. And I'm happy to know that there will be a, a place for exhibitions. I, I was in, um, in Holland, I, I've attended some other Holocaust memorials. I remember trying to find the, the memorial in Paris and never knowing whether I should be asking people, how do you say Jew in French? You know, it's a different, it's a different kind of a world and not so different. But the idea, and that's what, what Tyson was bringing up, was the transparency is really important because every time I drive by a building that has no windows, I suspect what's on the inside. Mm. I really do. I want to know what they're hiding. And and it's not about privacy. It's about something that deserves and must have transparency to it. So congratulations on on what what you're considering and what you're adding and, and the effort because I think I think it will work for the long run in Los Angeles. So congratulations. Thank you. I want to touch a little bit on what you said about the about the um original uh, interest in how this museum was started. Lauren is 100% right. This is actually the oldest Holocaust museum in the country. I forgot to mention that. And it was started, it's the only one that was started only by a group of survivors that had moved to the Fairfax district. And this is, shows the power of this like non-grand donor approach or collector's approach. It is it is really a group of people who would meet and decided they wanted to teach and tell their stories. And it did have very humble beginnings. And it is a very small museum. What I showed you is it's a tiny museum and we don't rely, it didn't at the time rely on technology. And it was a very um, just hard artifacts that were people's sole collections that they brought and handed over and it there was there is an intimacy about it, and I and I appreciate that. And Gabriel, I didn't I didn't um, uh, uh, I wanted to say also the you mentioned Yad Vashem in Israel. Moshe Safdi ends with a very celebratory like, "Look, here is life. Here are the mountains. Here you come up to you right. come up to to you know see 
um, you know, life as it is. And um, I think there is something inspirational there as well. We didn't have the room to do that. We were able to go in a circle. You end where you started was the was where we wanted to emphasize. His is a linear experience, which is great. These are all great stories. Mm -hmm. It's just different ways of experiencing yeah. it. And ours, we wanted to have you end where you started. That was really a, a strong philosophical uh, interest. And, you know, here we are again. It, 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 there is, Lauren, there is, should be a, always a celebration of life, but also the question, here we are again. How did we get here when we have so much history about this? Yeah. So that was really uh, two different methods. Um, and, uh, you know, anyways. Yeah. I think to the, uh, the connection with light is so significant. Yeah. You know, even in Safdi's uh, uh, Yad Vashem, there's the courtyard, the break between the two buildings. Right. Where you, you're back in the light and you're back in air and able right. to, to start uh, the whole process of trying to absorb uh, what cannot be absorbed. Exactly. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, the coming up on the uh, the alley of the righteous Gentiles and the trees at the end also is that 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 dialogue between darkness and light which exactly. seemed to be so essential let me let me add one other one other or two other short points one is that this museum was the west coast american representative of yad vashem mm -hmm. uh, it was the first one outside of israel so this but was I do not know. they were connected very closely with yad vashem and the other thing, Tyson, there is already in the in the museum a small, very small room with I think two monitors that captures the uh, Shoah Foundation's uh, of, uh, testimonies. Uh, you can look up people, and um, it's already there. They have a relationship. Oh, great! Thank you for. Yeah, so you can you can do that now. But I'm thinking about the object the opportunities that that the museum didn't have that could then are, are, are manifold. And uh, there were exhibitions of a man whose name was Ellie Leslie, who, uh, without going into great detail, was an artist who was in uh, Theresienstadt and then uh, did cartoons. He did uh, like editorial cartoons of life there. Yeah. So how do you familiar with this? Uh, to avoid all of this work being detected, he cut it up and buried it. And after he survived, they went back to get the material. They got it. He, he did another uh, another version of it with different colors. He lived in Israel. I think he's deceased now. He lived in Israel. But the pieces and the new version would have been a perfect um, place for this to be permanently exhibited. It's been yeah. shown by the um the the, the german uh, i can't all of a sudden i i, I blank the Goethe foundation in los angeles put it on uh once for a short period of time so this is going to really be a wonderful uh, place for this material to be seen where it might be otherwise traveling or just stuck yeah in the box. very good point yeah thank you john carr you have something uh, and you're muted right now so you'll need to unmute yourself, sir. So um, first of all, I very, very much enjoyed your presentation. Thank you. Uh, and, um, and I was glad that Tyson brought up Daniel Liebeskin's Holocaust Museum in Berlin, which was not mentioned in your original recital of museums that you had looked in, at. And the first thing that occurred to me as I was listening to that was, um, I've not been there, but I'm familiar with Daniel Liebeskin's work. And, um, uh, and but Tyson brought it up. And what, what, what really impressed me about uh, your building, which I absolutely love for, uh, for so many different reasons, um, for the first time, I had th thought that a mu museum can have traditional exhibits and attempt to teach literally, or it can teach experientially mm -hmm. and emotionally. And like I say, I've never been uh, to the Holocaust Museum in Berlin, but 
I've done a lot of reading about it. And of course, that's never the same as experiencing it. But the sense I have is that Liebeskin's approach uh, was to immerse the museum goer in the experience experience of what it was like, the twists and turns and not knowing where you go, and then being subterranean and looking up at the, at the, you know, through the, the glimpses, the very narrow glimpses of the, the sky. Uh, yours is sort of, it sounded to me an amalgam of both the traditional teaching museum with exhibits, but at the same time, I was intrigued how your existing building, you it was very important, it sounded to you, to have the kids playing basketball, have the kids in the park going about their daily life, while kids entering the museum are about to be exposed to, you know, um, one of the most horrible events of, of humankind. And so anyway, I thank you. Enjoyed it enormously. I was glad to hear we have a museum here in Salem by Moshe Safdi. Uh, and um, I'm calling from Salem, Mass. And um, I, I very much, very much enjoyed the program. And, and I'm, when I, we have our oldest son uh, in Burbank and we get out there a lot uh, in Southern California in the next visit. Uh, we're going to make a beeline to your to your museum. Thank you. Thank you, Great. Thank you John. And and you I think Margaret it. Margaret was uh, trying to uh, had her hand up. Margaret, you're muted. Yes, I I think that uh, that uh, Trevor, you you inserted a correction in in the um, in the chat, which is that the uh, Liebskin Museum in Berlin is the Jewish Museum and uh, the great portion of it, a large portion primarily is to uh, really recount and exhibit and tell the story of uh, the Jewish experience in Germany and in, in Europe. And that's, uh, and of course there's, there is the Holocaust element and some very powerful experiential um, portions of, of the building that are um, really devoted to that. Um, but it also tells tells a, a broader story as well. Okay. And it's it's interesting because, you know, uh, museums and memorials in Europe have this distinct advantage of being in Europe. But I see our advantage of, a, you know, a significant multicultural uh, patronage and and one which is you know we designed this museum and crossing our fingers that 15,000 students from LAUSD a year would come we were crossing our fingers for 15,000 and last year I believe they were at um, 75 or 80,000 and that's that's exceptional that's that's extraordinary and as I mentioned some of these schools the only field trip they take all year because uh, the museum uh, pays for the buses to bring them is this field trip. And so the first thing we have to ask ourselves is um, what are they thinking and what stories are they bringing with them? Because that's, that's that kind of, um, that's the complexity that we're trying to balance is really trying to connect with kids. You know, they're getting off this bus for about they've been on it for about an hour and their hormones are going they need to go to the bathroom there are all these real life things that are happening and yet and then they're hearing the basketball but they, and you're trying to connect them to the dialogue and it's it's a real like an interesting challenge it's not like all of us saying let's go to LACMA tomorrow and we make it a destination if you really put yourself in the head of these one of these you know 10th graders it's a very different thing and all of a sudden you have to shift from I'm out of my school, I'm on a bus, and now I'm being taught something that happened a long time ago to a group of people far away. So trying to connect it by virtue of experience and not just um, um, you know, a, a singular artifact that are that are imposing was really the the challenge. Mm. And it and it and so far it has worked because these schools keep coming back. 
and they're not coming back because we pay they pay for buses they come back because you know we they affect one two three kids out of 30 it's a success it's a huge success asking kids afterwards we have the we designed it so that you know a lot of the a lot of the um docents say what happens if you say no to somebody? What happens if you you turn a blind eye? And this is the environment to do it, right where somebody's playing basketball down the street, where or uh, sorry, not down the street, right next door, where you can say what happens when you say no to bullying, or you do check bullying. It's it's really profound, and and significant. But if it changes one, two, or three kids, it's it's a success. Anyways. I'd like to just say something else about um, the building and, and the experience. And one of the reasons I think it's so powerful, I've been to the museum a number of times. Um, and I think one of the reasons that, that children and young people engage and focus is that um, you've created a space that has scale that's appropriate to Thank you. the site and also to the um, the visitor, the, the, the person who's experiencing um, the space and then the information within it. Um, and I think if, if one wants to tie it back to sort of classical ideas, I know that your architectural expression is very contemporary and very exciting, but I think you've also captured something that, that you don't see <laughs> too often in uh, contemporary um, um, sort of... Um, statement architecture, which is the notion of, of scale and of human scale. And, mm. and I think that that's really important. I also want to apologize, Tyson, I called you, I called you the wrong name. And Don't worry about I, it. I knew it started with T. So. It's okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hagi, did you say when, the, um, when uh, construction is expected to begin on this? Oh, we're under construction. If you drive by right now, you'll see everything's going up and the building will be done a year from this June. Mm -hmm. And the, then we're giving the exhibits, we'll start the exhibits um, from June. So it'll probably be a year, hopefully the end of 2025 will be done. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's moving very, very quickly. And we are the space for show foundation to beta test their new technology. So I know I, I was hanging on uh, the interactive but um, but they are working on a, a full scale holographic AI where, you know, the show foundation is extraordinary. They're not just um, um, doing a archival witness of, um, of of the Holocaust survivors, but really of, of all genocide survivors that they can and with, you know, with the means they have. So having this technology in the building is really going to be quite extraordinary. It's very, it's incredibly cutting edge. Yeah. yeah. Does anybody else have anything they would like to ask or say? Okay. Um, Hagi, thank you very much, Gabriel. I know you thank have, you. Uh, you would like to say a few things. So please take it away, Gabriel. I always like to say a few things. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, just Hagi, just reflecting on your presentation a bit, you know, of course, Ruskin would say that all architecture expresses value, uh, including negative value. Um, but, you know, what's so, so, so striking about this like a shrine, really, or a sanctuary, it builds those values within the very structures of the architecture. You know, our 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 proclaiming values, uh, and uh, it's uh, again, I think, just uh, such a, a a thoughtful, soulful, uh, uh, you know, uh, approach that you've taken. Uh, um. We did go loved. We thank you for this uh, thoughtful and stimulating presentation, Hagi. Um, we'll be very interested when we're when we're close to the dedication date, or sometimes around that. We uh, we can have you back. Um, 
and also for our board members, Stuart and Beverly Denenberg, uh, and, and for all their efforts in, in arranging this uh, lecture this evening. Uh, also for Joseph Rodriguez, our, our tech, who, is, uh, who keeps, us, uh, keeps us flowing. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, upcoming events very quickly. Uh, um, on Thursday, April 11th, our old friend, the printer Andre Chavez of Clinker Press in Portland, Oregon, is giving us a presentation, Rubbing Shoulders with the Private Press Movement, which will be a tour of his own extraordinary uh, printing studio uh, and a lecture on the uh, going back to the private press movement of the late 19th century, also connecting uh, with the uh, Roycroft uh, campus in East Aurora, New York, which has experienced a revival of the uh, Roycroft uh, press, as well as other aspects of that uh, community. You'll find all this on our website, www.ruskinartclub.org under calendar. I'd also mention specifically, um, this is a new event. I don't think it's up on the website yet. Saturday, April the 27th from three to five, an in-person event. We're always delighted in these days to, to be able to have in-person events at the Telescope Studio in downtown Los Angeles, a tribute to LA City Poet Laureate, Lynn Thompson. So this will be an event honoring Lynn. There will be uh, tributes and readings, uh, a reception and food and wine. And so uh, be sure and join us for that. Uh, this will be under the direction of our literary programs director, Elena, the poet Elena Corina Byrne. Uh, at the end of this year, uh, we are doing uh, an international conference at USC, October 4th through 5th, uh, Ruskin in America. So it will be a full day, day, day and a half, a day and a bit, Friday and all day Saturday, a conference on Rusk, uh, uh, seven speakers giving us talks on various aspects of Ruskin's influence in America, all the more uh, remarkable because he was never here. As he once wrote to his American friends, he wasn't uh, prepared to be in any country where there were no castles. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, we'll be having, this is a, a unique conference, the first time we think anyone's done a full-scale uh, academic conference on Ruskin's contributions, not only to American arts education, but to uh, utopian communities and social reform uh, in the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century. So please mark that on your calendars, October 4th and 5th. Thank you all for coming. And on behalf of the Ruskin Art Club, we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Tyson. See you all. Thank you. Thank you, Argy. Thank you so much. Nice to meet you. Lauren, lovely to see you. Oh, she left. Okay. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Sorry, my ventriloquism wasn't working. Uh, I hope you're well, and that. Uh, and thank you very much for continuing to uh, present some wonderful programs. Well, I did. I, by the way, I did send a note after I got the first invitation, since it said it wasn't transferable. I did send a note trying to find out who I, how I could share it with other people. So I just noticed today that in the in the list of participants, you could actually add somebody by email. Yes. But it yes. Was, so so um, any anytime we get opportunities like that to share, I, I'd love to know that. Yep. Terrific. Okay. Take care. Be well. Bye bye. You too. Bye bye. bye, -bye.